Um, I was just saying, uh, well, hello everyone. First of all, very sorry for not being there in person this year. But uh, aren't you granting this pool once uh, a little break? Uh, we just go straight into the next torture. There is. You know that resilience is the, the the term that is used to say that you are on your own. So. Um, anyway, let me see. Uh, can you sh can you see my screen? We can. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, uh, hello everyone again. Um, pleasure to be with you. Uh, please, uh, uh, two, let's say, rules of the game for this session. The first one is that feel free to jump in and interrupt my flow whenever you like. We don't need to wait until the end of the presentation. Um, so the only, the only challenge is that I may not see your hand because I only see a portion of the room. So I rely on our colleagues uh, uh, from the uh, convening group uh, in the room to just, uh, you know, um, stop me and uh, give you the floor for a question or for a comment or for, a, you know, vehement disagreement and anything of the like. Uh, the, the second issue is with the interpreters. Uh, sometimes I tend to speak a bit fast uh, I'll try and control myself, but in case I don't, uh, please do the same. Just stop me and bring me back to order. Um, so the today's uh, segment, I know it comes uh, at the end of the second day, so you probably, on one hand, uh, been discussing many of these things. Uh, secondly, you probably be tired. So it will be a bit of a bird view, bird eye view presentation, okay? No deep uh, dive, but simply a little bit of maybe repetition or you know summary of things that you have discussed already, and maybe some additional elements, particularly on the international political economy uh, of debt and its relationship with the UN process, and in particular, the upcoming financing for development conference. Um, we'll basically touch seven points, okay? And of course, uh, I'll share with you my slides after this presentation. So no need really to taking notes. Uh, um, I think you can just, you know, uh, engage with my line of thoughts uh, and hopefully agree or disagree with it. So the structure of the presentation, as I said, goes through seven points. One, very quickly, in terms of looking at the determinants of debt, something that you have probably discussed already quite extensively in the last two days, so I'll be very quick. The second one is looking at the and understanding the key features of the global economy, and then connecting the two, you know, looking at how debt traps actually play a role uh, in the actual um, current form of hyper-globalization. Then we look at uh, the changing nature of debt, and in particular, the privatization of debt, and how this generates uh, very complicated political economies, uh, uh, almost of intractable nature. Um, and therefore, we will look at a very bird eye view of the existing fault solutions and maybe what an alternative to those solutions could be in terms of a multilateral legal framework on that. And lastly, we really look at that governance and the role of the United Nations. And this is the only piece on which maybe I'll dive in a little bit more uh, with three or four additional slides. Otherwise, everything else is just really, you know, very quick and um, and sort of uh, macro uh, rather than a deeper dive. So I probably won't take uh, the full time that is allocated. That means that we should stay within 
the time of the session, but hopefully we'll also have some discussions along the way or at the end. Now, first, um, understanding debt, right? You spent two days on it, so not much for me to add on it and to repeat, just to say that you will probably had a number of discussions that pointed out that debt is neither intrinsically good or bad, right? It's an instrument of public policy, and therefore uh, the way in which we assess debt depends on a number of circumstances. Uh, what is important for me in the context of an analysis of political economies, it's really looking at the determinants of, of, uh, of debt. Now, debt, by definition, is an expansion of fiscal space. That's always the macro determinant. But there are three layers which are important to expose. The first one, and I'm sure you discussed it, are the economic determinants of debt, right? Whether it's uh, um, liquidity tensions or the need for long-term investments for social or economic infrastructure, or also unexpected circumstances. You know, it could be catastrophes, extreme climate events, earthquakes, also war, right? You know, but normally this is the first layer of determinants and the one that we always confronted with within the public space, because there's always an economic reason uh, for debt, which really comes from, from this. Now, the second layer begins to be a little bit more interesting or intriguing, which are the so-called political determinants of debt, right? This has to do with the acquisition of consensus, particularly when we are confronted with multi-party coalitions. And also the so-called electoral cycle, which is based on generating a lot of so-called debt illusions, right? Because with debt illusions, we have uh, the illusion of something that is delivered now in the form of an extra spending in the forms of an investment uh, with a, some sort of a perception asymmetry uh, that uh, this somehow does not correspond to future tax payments. You know, there is that sort of debt illusion in this. But generally, um, the second layer of determinants are political and are very closely associated with the acquisition and the maintenance of consensus. Now, consensus may be with the wider population, but may also be with a, a restricted political elite, right? Um, so don't necessarily assign that a democratic dimension. It depends on the structure of power, on the nature of democratic space within each given country. So it can have different, you know, um, let's say connotations uh, of more or less uh, democratic nature. But what is really more interesting is the third layer of determinants, which has to do with the so-called systemic determinants of debt. And the systemic determinants are much more related uh, to the structure of the economy, because it's the structure of the economy that defines uh, the necessity to borrow, you know? And very often is the structure of the economy combined with uh, the structure of global monetary and financial systems. For instance, the availability of, uh, uh, you know, an excess of speculative liquidity or the unequal access to liquidity by some countries, the nature of interest regimes. So these systemic determinants are normally never spoken about. They are always hidden behind the immediate economic need to borrow and sometimes uh, that sort of political dimensions of debt. But rarely in our debt analysis, we really go deep and recognize that the necessity to borrow and the necessity to borrow under certain conditions uh, really depends on structural elements uh, which combine the structure of economies uh, of any one given country and the structure of global financial and monetary system. It's really the interplay between the two. Now, of course, uh, this has very deep uh, implications, and the implications are largely economic, first of all, 
you know, that may generate challenges with repayment capacity. Unfortunately, proper assessment of repayment capacity tends to lack most debt incurring decisions because they're often, you know, pushed by need and short term need. And as a result, the medium and the long term goes in a sense as consideration second orders. The other one is social implications because, uh, you know, as much as we tend to use the definition that, you know, debt is on all of us, uh, the reality is it's, that's not really the case. Um, there are asymmetric impacts on different social groups. Uh, and while ultimately future generations hold the burden of repayment, the reality is that particular social groups within those future generations have a greater burden than other. So debt is not neutral in the way in which imposes social implication. It tends to be highly asymmetric on certain social group, class, elites, and particularly gender. And lastly, it has, of course, political implications. Uh, why? Because debt, of course, reduces the policy space and reduces the policy space because it very often associated uh, with a number of traps and lock-ins, which we'll see in a moment, in a minute, and sometimes even involves uh, a limitation of serenity, because incurring debt means also constraining policy options uh, to the necessity and the imperatives of repayment. So it's important to recognize that and as a first uh, element is that while we tend to see you know those sort of economic determinants as the drivers of debt there are deep systemic um, determinants and equally deep social political implications uh, in the way in which debt uh, actually plays out uh, in its uh, repayment agenda now, that's, that's the first piece, right? And understanding with a very macro view, debt. Now, where and how do we locate debt within our understanding of the global economy? Now, before we look at this connection, let's try and describe the global economy in terms that can somehow characterize for the purpose of our discussion here. There are very many different ways to skin a cat, as, as a good friend says, but let me try to provide five different um, characterizations uh, that can help understanding the global economy. Now, the first one is the notion of delocalization. You know, delocalization is probably the fundamental pillar of the current uh, pattern of globalization. It's based on a notion of specialization in which different countries do specialize uh, in certain elements of the production chain. And therefore, it's based on a center periphery model on which the base instruments uh, that connects the dots uh, are so-called global value chains. Now, unfortunately, global value chains uh, are, are very often the driver of commodity dependence uh, and, but also import dependence. Why? Because on one hand, tend to specialize in the, in the case of many African countries, uh, in the export of either uh, agricultural commodities or minerals, uh, and basically import every, everything else. And therefore, the focus of infrastructural development becomes fundamentally one of supporting these extractive and importing infrastructure. Now, this notion of delocalization globally generates a, a, a very high level of disconnect between sectors, first and foremost, the disconnect between primary manufacturing and services, but also between different actors, but also the breaking down of social and ecological contracts. Because in most export producing uh, portion of the economy, there is no immediate link between wages of workers in that sector and the acquisition of the product that they actually produce. As a result, there are no virtual cycle that expand, demand, strengthen the economy and make it circular. You know, it's mostly extractive. 
So delocalization and disconnect is the first characteristic of the global economy. The second important piece is extraction. Now, extraction is a term you've used many times, but in this particular case, we really refer to the fact that global value chains are much more about grabbing value than adding value. And why? Because of unequal terms of inclusion, where, for instance, labor is not adequately remunerated. And in fact, we have a constant reduction on the share of labor over GDP. We have a continuous compression of wages, precisely for the reasons that I mentioned before. But it's also the continuous uh, lack of any consideration for social reproduction and care, you know, which are simply meant to subsidize the economy without, uh, you know, corresponding to any very clear, you know, value proposition. But you can go ahead with the consideration of social, health, and ecological externalities, because basically, while the impact in social, health, and ecology of production for exports remains localized, uh, nobody actually pays uh, for those externalities. They are left for the communities that are deprived, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, minerals, commodities, and more. So the second important nature beyond delocalization and disconnect uh, is really extraction. Now, the third piece of the global economy is deregulation. Now, deregulation it's a combination of a deregulatory push, you know, in which basically private sector activity, particularly when it comes to these extractive practices, is highly deregulated, but is also combined with explicit international agreements that limit the sovereignty of the state. So it's important to uh, to understand this because sometimes we have the impression that deregulation is just a vacuum. In fact, this is not the case. Deregulation is highly regulated. You know, it's highly regulated in the sense of really constraining the capacity of the state to intervene in terms of public policies and public investments under a set of international agreements that basically lead to the notion of a minimal state, particularly the notion of the developmental state brought to the minimum. Why? Because basically they always market-based solutions to public problems with the constant fiscal and policy capture that actually correspond to then an underfunding of the public space. So deregulation is not really a vacuum, but is actually actively regulated to minimize uh, minimize uh, the role of the state, minimize its normative power, minimize the extent of regulatory interventions on uh, uh, those actors uh, that engage in global value chain, uh, um, and therefore in this combination of delocalization and extraction. The fourth piece, uh, is really about financialization. Now, everything that we have discussed until now has to do with basically real economy uh, uh, dy dynamics. Now, in reality, over the past uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, there has been a process of uh, continuous increase uh, in the primacy of global finance over the real economy. No? Therefore, an increased importance of financial actors, financial markets, and financial products in economic decision making. And this has also been helped by the way in which past financial crises have been dealt with, particularly when it comes to quantitative easing interventions in the global north that has generated a very significant amount of hot money uh, you know, large amount of speculative funds that were in that particular moment operating in very low interest regimes in the global north and therefore have been sort of storming the global south uh, 
in search for higher remunerations. So increasingly, it's, impo it's impossible to actually understand the global economy if we decouple it from the global financial dimensions and angle of it. It's really closely interconnected between production, trade, and finance. Lastly, um, you, you have to, all of these has a particular governance architecture. And this governance architecture is uh, dominated by developed countries and the institutions that they highly control, mostly the Bretton Woods institutions, Bank and the IMF, but also the OECD, the WTO, as well as the Group of Seven, the Group of 20. So in all of these, the architecture maintains very close roots uh, within a set of institutions uh, that have asymmetric governance arrangements because are basically dominated and completely uh, including by very strong majority and veto powers uh, by developed countries uh, and a small, very small group of industrialized nations. So this is the kind of economy within which we need to locate debt, you know, and the kind of political, systemically determined debt that I was describing before. So how do we connect the dots, right? Um, um, and I, I haven't seen any hands raised, so I assume I, I can proceed. So how do we connect uh, these um, debt with all of this? Well, first of all, you know, uh, when we're talking about debt traps, uh, um, certainly we can say that debt traps consolidate inequality traps. Why? Because debt service induce a diversion of public resources and once again with very asymmetric impact on social groups you know that's what we see all the time that's what you know we always expose to when we highlight you know the amount of debt services against health or education expenses for instance right and therefore this is where we see the diversion the fact that debt consolidates um, inequalities within countries, and certainly this is asymmetric on social groups because it tends to have a bigger impact on those already marginalized that already, uh, you know, um, have a greatest necessity for public services uh, of various types. But I think we need to resist the, simpli the simplistic notion that the problems begins and ends here. Um, the second layer is that debt traps are really closely intertwined, closely interconnected with commodity traps and export-driven strategies. Why that? Because in many cases, debt, and very often debt in hard currencies, uh, basically requires the continuation of exports and commodity uh, dependence because that's the only way to acquire hard currency in order to repay debt. So whenever uh, you know any given government is confronted with alternative economic strategy, a situation of, of significant debt and significant debt service uh, in hard currency imposes very clear economic strategy choices. You know, so basically debt actually locks in that notion of global division of labor in which some countries are obliged to remain stuck within commodity dependence and export driven uh, growth. Now, the second dimension of this is not only in terms of real economy strategies, but you already understand how debt maintains and strengthens currency hierarchies. Because of course, when debt is denominated in euros or dollars, uh, automatically not only we support the euro or dollar economy and the capacity therefore of those countries in incurring debt uh, in, in a different circumstances than we can, but it also establishes a very clear normative hierarchy 
between local currencies uh, and these art currencies, inducing very often effects uh, of devaluatory pressure that we have seen so much at play in recent, in recent terms. So it's not only traps lock in uh, commodity and export-driven strategy and therefore economic choices, but they also lock in monetary and financial strategies. Lastly, the problem is uh, that whenever these deep traps get into distress, a set of false solutions basically deepen the traps themselves. Why? Because the fundamental answer to debt distress has been to provide more loans, but those loans come with conditionalities, with structural adjustment programs, no matter whether they are called like this or they have more fancy names, but ultimately with policy conditionality that tends to reinforce the cycle. So you see very well how basically debt is at the core of that global division of labor because not only it consolidates uh, inequality traps within countries, but also consolidate inequalities between countries by reinforcing in both economic, financial, and monetary terms uh, that uh, uh, global division of labor. And at the same time, that distress becomes extremely functional to policy conditionalities that you know strengthen the foregoing. So you really see how debt is at the core of many of these traps. Um, now, I hope you're still following me. Now, what has happened now in the in the latest phase uh, is that uh, what used to be a debt between sovereigns uh, increasingly became private. You know, so the increase, a significant increase of uh, foreign sovereign debt in private hands, uh, has basically led to a somehow intractable problems. Right. First of all, the reason for this is because the political nature of debt, what we've seen at the beginning, is increasingly challenged by the commercial, contractual, and even speculative nature of private debt. Right, And this unfortunately establishes or actually changes the normative hierarchy. You know, every government should first and foremost uh, be uh, uphold his duty bearer responsibility, you know, with respect to its population, its human rights, and everything else. But very often, his commercial commitment to investors uh, acquires a normative hierarchy that actually replaces and completely changes the normative hierarchy that should be established in the notion of a developmental state. Now, this uh, induces a number of implications. The first one is that debt restructuring and debt cancellations are no longer a political problem. You know, the way it was, for instance, prior to the Jubilee in 2000. You know, it, it, they became extremely complicated because they confront these commercial and contractual rules, uh, and they actually lack, uh, uh, at the current moment, any clear legal instrument uh, that can ensure private sector participation. Yes, I'm sure some of our speakers have spoken about contractual action clauses and other forms, but in broad terms, but I view, we still do not have um, any significant legal instrument that can actually secure and ensure private sector participation in restructuring processes. Um, it also makes uh, uh, borrowing countries uh, extremely vulnerable to global financial markets and changes in interest regimes. You've seen what is happening now over the past few years with these uh, skyrocketing of interest rates and what this has meant in terms of debt service implications. And con con in conjunction with this, it actually highlights uh, the devious role uh, which is played by credit rating agencies, uh, um, particularly given their conflicts of interest, uh, 
And this generates, uh, you know, this enunciation apocalypse plans because it makes very, very difficult for borrowing countries to even stick their neck out, even suggest uh, that they begin to have uh, a debt distress situation because credit rating agency immediately will penalize its access to capital markets and immediately induce a pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical response. And lastly, uh, what we've seen that this hot private speculative money bubble also generates many more opportunities uh, for illegitimate and irresponsible lending. You know, the usual, you know, deals behind the carpet, so to say. So unfortunately, what is already a, a quite complicated problem is rendered intractable somehow by this notion of privatization. Now, um, where do we stand uh, in terms of addressing all of these? Unfortunately, and this is not the purpose of my presentation, so I'll be, I'll be quick on this, we are surrounded uh, by many false solutions. You know, Well, the first uh, elements of false solution is some sort of reductionism to contractual debt without any recognition that borrowing countries uh, are de facto creditors of both colonial and ecological debt. You know, whenever you stay within debt within sovereigns, uh, that political consideration can be played, right? Because you're talking in political terms. But when you shift to a much higher level of private sector participation, as in the case of most African countries, then you uh, uh, unfortunately are confronted to that reductionism to contractual debt because politics is something else, is something that does not have to do with the functioning of financial and monetary markets. The other important elements of these false solutions, therefore they don't want to hear about the wider political context of debt, but the second one is a constant under-characterization of the systemic determinants of the crisis is not because economies are trapped into commodity dependence, is not because of the nature of global financial markets, it's not because of the nature of global interest regime. You know, debt distress always ends up uh, as a public financial mismanagement responsibility. It's always characterized in those terms. It's always a problem of the borrowing countries uh, not doing things right, you know? So there is that notion of tribunal somehow against any one single country without any consideration of what went wrong. And I think we saw this very clearly at play during COVID, you know? During COVID, the entire global economy slowed down, therefore export-led collapse, commodity-driven, collapsed, and therefore economy started going into recession even without a health emergency, even if COVID had not actually reached some countries. And automatically, as soon as the economy slows down, debt becomes bigger and more problematic. None of this was really taken into any serious consideration besides a few kicking down the row approaches with debt suspensions. The, set, the third element is a very biased uh, analysis of debt distress, you know, which is always characterized uh, as a liquidity issue, you know, rather than a solvency one. And the reason why it's characterized uh, as a liquidity issue is because there is an over optimism on growth scenario. You know, there's always the idea that the economy will restart and you will fix it all. You know, it's hyper-globalization that is going to save us all. And as a result of that um, overemphasis on the liquidity rather than solvency issue, the primary solution that is always offered in one form or the other is basically to address debt challenges with more loans. You know, just making the problem bigger and kicking the problem down the road. Now, interestingly, these solutions are also always shaped on a single country case, literally as a tribunal 
of creditor against one single uh, borrowing country is uh, um, in creditor dominated spaces, being it the, the Paris Club, being it the IMF, being it anything else. But anyway, always with the tribunal of creditors, with one borrowing countries, and with you know the overarching influence of credit rating agencies that rather than appreciating an effort to find a proper restructuring on an sustainable le debt level, immediately penalize it with pro-cyclical implications, you know? So this is unfortunate. You see how it's not only the bias analysis, but also the undemocratic context and the very biased, uh, you know, space in which this is generated and discussed uh, that lead to that for solutions. So overall, you know, no matter how much you, you, you structure them, but the story is always the same. Provide more loans uh, to repay pending loans, uh, and but uh, because the notion is one of mismanagement, uh, then combine this with various degrees uh, of policy conditionality and austerity, because we need to bring back, you know, that public finance mismanagement into order. Now I know this is a very bird eye view analysis. Is not technical. You certainly have discussed in much greater depth many of these issues, but it's important somehow to maintain a political view of this entire process rather than get only into the technical nitty gritty. Now, how do we come out of it? What is uh, the possible uh, solution to this approach? Well, what we as civil society, as civil society FFD mechanism, as many of the partners that are co convening Dana believe, we now need to break with the past uh, discussions on debt and really need a multilateral legal framework on debt, you know, something like a, a binding global convention on debt that would comprehensively address the issue of unsustainable and legitimate debt, including through extensive cancellation. But this multilateral legal framework would provide a clear normative uh, response to a set of different components. First of all, clarify norms for responsible lending and borrowing. And this, of course, in also involves some enforcement mechanisms. Um, secondly, have clear norms for contract information disclosure and management. You know, in some cases, countries that are confronted with that stress uh, do not even know who their creditors are, you know, because of several layers of lack of transparency within the debt architecture. Third, we need uh, a new approach to debt sustainability assessments that challenges the normative hierarchy that places uh, social expenditures uh, or expenditure for the realization of human rights at the very last point. We need to ring fence uh, these fundamental roles of the state uh, because they cannot be subject to you know, the current approach uh, to uh, repayment of debt. Uh, fourth, uh, we need, of course, to have a clear non-creditor-centric uh, debt restructuring, debt workout mechanism that allows systematic, orderly restructuring of debt in one place uh, with clear uh, enforcement to the participation of the private sector. Fifth, uh, we need to reform the credit rating system to tackle its conflict of interest. It's therefore, and it also allow restructuring, provide a premium to restructuring from a public perspective while therefore maintaining market access. And lastly, we need clear state contingent instruments, including for climate emergencies, for climate catastrophes or extreme events that uh, are automatic, that immediately kick in as soon as certain critical events uh, are um, uh, taking place. Now, people say, oh, go, no, that's, that's very fine. I'm going to dream about this at night along with so many other fairy tales 
in which we all run in nice green grasses and more. Well, yeah, uh, I do understand that it sounds a little bit like that. But this was exactly the same feeling when countries were campaigning to have a global UN tax convention to tackle illicit financial flow. It's exactly the same approach. It's exactly the same situation. It also sounded as, an, as a fairy tale at that time. So that takes me to the last set of questions. Um, debt governance. If we want a multilateral legal framework, why the UN? Why the UN is the only space where this could be pursued? Well, first of all, what is important is that in the debt policy discussions globally, there has been, over the past years, a primacy of policy discussion. How do we fix this? How do we fix that? You know, and in many ways, the governance question, the fundamental governance question, has been kept under the radar. So I think we need to change this equation. We need to restore the primacy of the governance issue versus the policy issue. You can do policy reforms only after you got governance right. Otherwise, you end up discussing policy recipes uh, while always the same usual suspects take decisions. And those decisions will certainly not be in the interest of borrowing countries. They will be largely in the interest of status quo and the institutions that they command. So some people say, oh, okay, this is the usual game of you know proposing to choose this versus that. Well, discussing the UN doesn't mean uh, being oblivious to all its power asymmetries and limitation. It's just a matter of choosing the right turf for our struggle. And the reason why the UN is a proper turf for our struggle for a multilateral legal framework and debt is because the UN provides five fun fundamental issues. Now, first of all, jurisdiction. Now, uh, it's only the United Nations that have jurisdictional capacity. And the moment in which you want a binding convention, a multilateral legal framework, uh, not uh, you know the current status quo, it's only you, you need a normative intervention. You need to define rules. And therefore, the fact of having an institution that has jurisdiction is fundamental. If you don't have it, nothing can be done. Now, no G20, no IMF, no World Bank, no Paris Club, none of these institutions have jurisdictions. You know, so it's clear, first and foremost, that we need the UN because we need its jurisdictional authority. Secondly, um, the UN is the only space in which we can somehow tame the use of pure economic power on the basis of developmental considerations. You know, we can confront this conversation on the basis of human rights, on the basis of a developmental progress and agenda, which we cannot do in other spaces. Third, it's democratic. Doesn't mean that it's free of power asymmetries. And we see every day with its incapacity to provide a clear response to a genocide. But um, um, still, all countries can negotiate and decide. And this can only happen there. You know, and the decision to initiate a process for a UN tax convention is a demonstration of that democratic nature. Um, fourth, um, it helps exposing and addressing interconnections. I think the seeing how debt interconnects closely with many different dimensions of trade, of tax, of inequalities and social policies, uh, require a context in which all of these can be connected, not one in which we purely address the contractual nature of debt, one in which uh, the issue of debt is basically brought back uh, to the basic question, when can you pay, and nothing else. And then lastly, it's a space where we as civil society have a right to participate. 
along with indigenous people and other societal constituencies. So these characteristics uh, help electing the UN as the space, as the turf, uh, where we can really advance uh, our struggle. Now, concretely, um, we do have uh, an opportunity, and the opportunity comes uh, from the FFD process, in particular to the upcoming process towards uh, a fourth financing for development conference. Well, concretely within the UN, the financing for development process is actually what provides that sort of governance window, right, for the reform of the international financial architecture, springing from the initial called Monterey Consensus in 2022. Now, besides the history, and maybe I'll, I'll give you a few hints about it in a minute, what is important to, to appreciate is that the fourth financing for development conference is actually coming up in June 2000, sorry, there's a mistake here, June 2025, and the negotiations are about to start with the first preparatory committee, which will take place in Addis Ababa in late July. So basically, we are kicking off the negotiation process for FFD4. Now, FFD has largely been precisely the space where developing countries have been struggling to counter the hegemony of the global north in economic governance. And I think we FFD4 starts with the potential positive spillover effect in terms of enthusiasm, in terms of ambition, of the historic decision to initiate a path towards the UN tax convention. I'm pretty sure that Francis has articulated that uh, uh, quite uh, uh, adequately in his own presentation. And uh, therefore, this gives us a political opportunity as civil society to campaign towards critical intergovernmental decisions in that space. Now, before I close, uh, let me allow you just a couple of slides to give you a little bit more details on FFD, considering that we speak about it as a, as a major opportunity, so it's therefore good to know a little more about it. Just two slides, so it's, it's, uh, it's not long. Well, the first one is about the genesis and character, right? So I've already mentioned FFD starts in 2002 with the Monterey Consensus. Now, it's important to recognize that it really starts at the request of developing countries after all the conferences in the 90s have really placed many responsibilities on them without associated resources. So it's really demanded from the Global South, from the Group of 77. Now, it starts as an international conference under the ages of the UN with the explicit intent of providing an umbrella for the World Bank, for the IMF, for WTO, you know, to operate under the guidance and leadership of the General Assembly. So institutionally, this is quite important because it really calls for convergence, but also for the full sovereignty of the UN General Assembly. It is born as a normative process, you know, a process to take decisions, and is basically focused on uh, global systemic economic reforms across all different action pillars. No, no point of mentioning them all, but from tax to finance and everything which is in between, uh, including a set of cross-cutting issues, the most prominent of which being really women's rights and gender equality. Now, what is interesting in the history of FFD as this global normative process under the UN, that uh, after the DOA review conference in 2008, uh, there is a key bifurcation because that's the time of the financial crisis. And therefore, that's the time in which the UN calls for a crisis conference under FFD, which is actually pro generates a very progressive and interesting outcome. But it's precisely at that time that the G20 is born as an explicit effort by US and allies to counter the attempts to address the crisis in the UN. 
So it's important to recognize and always remember that the G20 is actually uh, being brought at head of state level um, precisely to counter the request for democratization of governance uh, that was coming in the context of a crisis uh, in 2008, 2009. So that's the reason why the G20 is, in a sense, an alter ego to the UNFFD process. Now, the last step bef before the current phase uh, is uh, for the conference in Addis Ababa in 2015, which was negotiated together with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement, and therefore already embraces a very strong uh, you know, financing of sustainable development dimension that to some extent is counter to that agenda for systemic reforms. But this is a very brief historical record of what has happened in 20 plus year of FFD. Now, uh, what is uh, really FFD's understanding of financing? Well, three quick points. The first understanding of financing of FFD from Monterey is the appreciation that social economic transformation in developing countries cannot really happen without supporting and enabling trade, monetary, financial, and more frameworks. But it's also an appreciation that financing is not really the proper term. You know, financing evokes the idea of many money that pays for things, right? And the, the the notion of FFD is really to shift from the centrality of financial flows uh, and all the asymmetries of power that come with it to really advance systemic reforms that generate and expand fiscal space, uh, keeping resources in the South. And I think I've added this little graph, the only one, which shows how only related to debt in 2021-2022, the net transfers uh, are actually negative. So more money goes out of developing countries than actually goes in. You know, So keeping resources in the South and expanding fiscal space through policy and governance reform is really the centrality of FFD, rather than uh, you know, uh, chasing financial flows. And this means centering therefore on governance reform with this idea of rebalancing the body center of decision making towards the UN to really try to democratize global economic governance. So to conclude, you know, it's fair to say, you know, you're claiming this has been up and running for 20 plus years. What has been achieved, what has achieved and what are its blind spots? Well in terms of achievement, I think it has really generated uh, a counter process where develop, uh, developing countries could challenge, could contrast the hegemony uh, of developed countries. And I think this is really what the tax process has been about, a fight to reclaim tax governance from the OECD into a democratic process for a global UN tax convention. Jury's out, but it certainly has been the greatest victory in a long time. And I think we probably need to ride uh, on in, uh, in debt governance uh, on the spillover effect uh, in terms of ambition and enthusiasm that that generates. So it really established a window within the UN for contestation and for struggle to shift you know, this very center of decision making away from the IMF, the OECD, the WTO, and more. You know, and the very fact that it has managed to keep the struggle alive uh, and therefore counter the um, hegemonic attempt, I think he is probably the greatest achievement of the UNFFB process. Now, it has, however, a number of challenges and blind spots. The first one is that under the pressure of the financing of the SDGs, uh, there has been an erosion over the years uh, of the strong focus on systemic reforms and, uh, and the shift uh, more to the financial gap narrative. Where's the money kind of narrative. Now, I think the 
the UN tax process is the first counterbalance to this. It's the first attempt to put the dots where they should be. And I think what we have with FFD4 and DEPT is an opportunity to do the same, to follow through it, and, and to really do the same with respect to DEPT. No, we don't want to discuss policy. We don't want to discuss technical fixes. We want to discuss debt governance, and we want to clarify what are the rules, the normative framework for different dimensions of the debt problem. The second challenge of blind spot has been a certain disconnect between development finance and real economy transformation. And this is facilitated somehow from the erosion of uh, work on trade, which has been captured at that geo, and also on global financial and monetary regulation captured by the G20. And I think one of the challenges of FFD4 is to counter this, to re-establish a strong link to the kind of development financing, to the kind of systemic reforms that can actually connect closely with structural transformation. And last is the fact that climate finance is largely outside of the FFD agenda. Sometimes this is a good thing, but uh, of course, uh, in the current phase, there's a lot of interconnections uh, and the space for climate finance remains UNF triple C. Okay, but this doesn't mean that there are a lot of narratives which are impacting development financing because of climate. Now, let me just uh, conclude with some uh, take home messages and then open the floor for your thoughts and consideration. The first one is that I hope uh, I've tried to make the case uh, for how debt regimes uh, are really the backbone architecture that connects economic, trade, financial, and monetary system. They are really the black box that connects all of these. And in many ways, the current division of labor, the international political economy of the way in which globalization is structured, finds within that regimes uh, is fundamental pillar. That also means that debt uh, is therefore the, has been and continues to be the mainstream instruments that have led to policy alignment, sometimes policy subjugation of developing countries uh, to fit within a very well established role within neoliberal globalization. You know, and I think recognizing this means that debt is much more than debt. Debt is actually the key to unlock uh, an alternative approach uh, to the pattern of globalization. If we want to change globalization, we need to break the chains of debt. Without it, it will be impossible because of the multiple lock-ins uh, nationally and internationally that we have exposed before. Now, however, it's important to recognize that this is not a policy challenge. It's not about uh, finding a new silver bullet to fix these or these other technical dimension of debt. It's really a governance challenge. Or well, now we can create different democratically set rules uh, that clarify that regime and create a democratic uh, economic governance and debt governance. And to do this, the only available turf, not perfect, by far perfect, but is the United Nations. And FFD4 in the next uh, uh, 12 to 15 months uh, really offers that tangible opportunity for leapfrogging, you know? But this requires very strong determination from civil society, very strong coherence in the way in which we engage nationally, regionally, and globally, and particularly no distraction, no chasing of red herrings uh, um, into, you know, small little technical diversions. That I really hope uh, it's what we'll manage to do in the next 12 months collectively at various levels. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Stefano, for yeah, delivering such a very technical subject in uh, the afternoon. But I think you've done a very good job at uh, delivering it and just trying to
help us see how what we've been learning in the past two days fit into the the global picture of it all. So maybe I'll open it up to the floor. So yes, Martin, then Gabriel. Yes. Hi, Stefano. This is Martin Sunke speaking from Africa Development Exchange Network. Thank you very much for this because you You've brought a digester for us to digest all what we learned since yesterday, and it was so comprehensive. Now, please uh, set your seat because I'm going to bring to you 45 concerns. <laughs> I see you are shivering, but I'm going to reduce it to three. You see, I'm kind enough. Uh, actually, uh, w what I want to know from these three things that I'm going to put forth for you is whether these can fit into a solution or if these are possible pillars for a solution to the kind of concerns that you, you raised. Because you very well gave us the picture of the global landscape of the economy, and you also touched on the kind of challenges that we are having with debt before then giving us a lot of insight on financing for development. Uh, what I'm wondering is you touched on private sector lenders. Is there any way looking at uh, what some say is just a problem of liquidity, is there any way uh, we will be able to redefine the kind of risk that we impose upon these lenders? That is the first thing. The second thing is you talked about the, these, these actors, the, the, the Paris Club and the other clubs. Is there any way we as Africans and, uh, and we from developing countries can uh, look at something which is like a creditors club to see how we impose things upon uh, our lenders? And now to finish with the third thing is, in that landscape that you, you presented, where do you see the African financial institutions fit. If we come to get that B and put it in that landscape, what kind of solution can it bring? So those are the three things. You see, Stefano, I'm kind enough. I brought it from 45 to 3. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Martin. C can you can you repeat the the third one? Because uh, there was some noise, I couldn't understand. I understood the first two very clearly, but the third one. Oh, Stefano, you see, you you missed the the, the 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 most important part of it. The third one is about you see the landscape that you presented. Is there wh where 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 would the the African financial institution fit if these come to be? And will that be able to bring a solution in the issue for the issues that we are having in the present landscape? How do you see that? Okay, shall we collect more questions or shall I begin responding? Yes, let's speak some more. Uh, thank you first for the very comprehensive and very interesting presentation. Uh, well, I have a comment and uh, two questions. The comment is regarding this idea that debt is the new slavery and couldn't agree more. And I think that in your first slide, I think the second, when you talk about the determinants of debt, 
we had that we have their political determinants and i think this plays a significant role uh for the situation that we are, we are facing right now where we have when we look at the rules to exercise the rules of game to exercise power in our states in my country for example you will see that power or state state resources are used to reproduce power by the ruling elite and that is one of the main sources that, that are, is being used right now to continue financing the political settlements in our in our countries for the question uh, for the questions um, the first one is well you described the multi multilateral uh, legal framework as a fairy tale uh, that might eventually come to reality i was just wondering if you are seeing that uh, happening anytime soon and perhaps share some some views in terms of who is pushing this agenda, this agenda in terms of the states uh, that are leading uh, this agenda and what role can civil society play? And the second is related to how this instrument, to what extent this instrument can help us uh, fight irresponsible lending from private, private creditors. Is there space there to, you know, uh, how, how, I just wanted to understand more if you could elaborate on how could this uh, multilateral legal instrument help us uh, fight uh, responsible lending from private creditors? Because you say it's, it's, a it's a convention, okay? It's binding, but it's binding for who? Like for the states? Or it, it goes, goes to that dimension of the private sector and to which, ex to which uh, extent? The last one, I promise is this, uh, for now, these false solutions that you presented are focusing, as you said, on this reductionism to uh, the, the contractual debt and ignore uh, the debt that is related to you know, colonialism and also this issue of climate justice. How do we address this in terms of true solutions, I would put it this way? My question uh, might sound impatient, but it's because I've had these things since I was a teenager. Now I'm in my 30s. Uh, please, I'd like to hear your expert view on some of these developments which are not mainstream, but I think will have a solution, will move us towards uh, some kind of solution to the situation that we're faced with. Um, Putin, Vladimir Putin of Russia, has suspended the uh, use of the USD and the Euro on their trading, uh, on their stock markets, perhaps because of sanctions and so on. That some Latin American countries have expressed serious opposition to Western economic dominance. Uh, the emergence of the BRICS as a bloc and then we see occasional action from the Emirates uh, when they try to push back against Western dominance. In Africa, we've not had as much urgency except for talk around the idea of a one African currency, nicknamed the Afro. When will we get angry enough? It seems the rest of the world appreciates the death of the UN or the multilateral system, why are we still ha having hopes, high hopes in the UN when on the public health front, I'm talking about COVID, it has manifest, it manifestly failed and handed over the whole thing to Bill Gates to manage COVID. There's a genocide ongoing in Gaza. They are unab completely unable to stand up to Israel and several other injustices that we see. Why do we think that the, the UN will resolve this situation? Um, 
don't we need to borrow some of the madness from people like, uh, madness in quotes, from people like Vladimir Putin, the Iranians, the Mexicans, to break out of this situation? Something has to give. And I think it has to be radical and very imaginative. Thank you. Any more questions? Or maybe, Stefano, you can respond to those, then maybe you could take the next round after that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I wish I have responses uh, to this, right? Um, I can just chip in a few, a few ideas. Um, le let me start with some of the points that Martin has raised. Uh, by the way, hi, Martin. Nice to see you, and sorry for not seeing you in person. Um, let me start from the point on the, the on the on the borrowers club, right? Um, now I think there is a, of late a certain attention to the idea that borrowers can also have their own cartel, uh, if you can call it like this. It's not a new idea. It's something that it's a rejuvenation of uh, old approaches. My personal feeling is that this is certainly important, but the greatest cartel uh, is the one when they come together and negotiate for a new set of rules, you know? Because there are intrinsic limitations uh, because of the very dispersed, asymmetric, uh, and insufficient uh, set of normative uh, you know, elements in the current architecture which is really a non-architecture, much more than an architecture. Um, and therefore, there are limitations to borrowers' coordination. Yeah, there's a lot of learning that can be done from one to the other. But ultimately, you know, that doesn't change the reality of the fact that uh, debt continues to be negotiated with a, with a tribunal of creditors. You know? So if you want to alter those circumstances, if you want to change the nature and the conditions and the weak certain state contingents, uh, you know, situations kick in. If you want to have a proper space uh, for debt restructuring, if you want to have proper instruments uh, for private sector participation, if you want to contrast the normative hierarchy that puts contractual repayment prior to human rights obligation, you know, there's, there's no borrower club that can help. You know, you need to get countries to basically agree together and campaign together exactly as they have done on tax uh, for a new different normative framework that can address this situation. So not that I'm, I see that negatively. I think it's, it's certainly important to have increasing borrower coordination and, and political cohesion. But where they really, the real, real turf is the normative uh, rulemaking uh, intervention, much more than the defense agenda with the current uh, creditor dominated frameworks and spaces. Now, that takes me to the question on African uh, institutions. I, I do think that. Um, uh, sometimes, rather than finding a very minor and marginal role, uh, you know, through cooptation in existing institutions, by having a little percentage point more into the IMF or Bretton Woods governance, or by having somebody that attends the G20 as if Africa is a country, you know, I think it's time to really put proper emphasis to the unfinished program for an African financial architecture. African financial architecture. There's a, there's a fantastic piece uh, by our good friend uh, um, Adebayo Lukoshi, delivered uh, at Afroda, Afgod, uh, uh, Jason, was it two years ago, I think? Uh, yes, um, Malawi. You know, which, which I think has also been published uh, Maybe, Jason, I'll, I'll share them with you because I, you have them. But let's say I'll reshare them for easier reference because I think it's a very brilliant piece uh, together with a couple of other ones uh, that can remind us on how uh, 
the development of African financial architecture can actually contrast many of the dynamics uh, uh, that are here at play, rather than purely playing in, in the co-option into institutions uh, in which uh, eventually the role remains extremely, extremely marginal. And, you know, this is exactly what has happened on tax. At some point, uh, the story was that the, the region did converge together with a very strong political position, that the only path forward was for a UN task convention, and he won uh, that, uh, that argument. Now, that takes me to the other question of, um, you know, who are really, who is pushing this agenda of, uh, the, other, of the other colleague here? What are the expectations? Well, um, it's difficult, you know, uh, debt is much more complicated than tax. And I think the reason that is at so much at the core of the global division of labor, uh, you know, is, uh, explains very well why that is so complicated. I think there is a, uh, generally a very, very significant awareness that this is the problem. This is the defining problem of FFB4, and there is currently no solution on the horizon. You know, uh, all member states uh, speak very frontally about the centrality of these issues for them and the fact that they don't see any of the little things that are being worked on as being helpful. So I know this is not maybe the answer you wanted. Um, I don't think there is still a very clear compact of countries that is determined uh, to push this agenda forward in a very deliberate effort. Why? Because of that enunciation apocalypse uh, that we discussed before. A lot of countries are, re are always resistant to stick their neck out, you know? and. Um, uh, but my feeling is that these can be catalyzed. And this is precisely what our role as civil society should be. Convince, in particular, a group of African countries to take the lead uh, on these issues uh, in addition to tax. Because if they really want an expansion of it to space, combining the tax and debt struggle, clearly, in normative governance terms, is really what needs to happen. So. I know that this is maybe a less enthusiastic response because that consensus that you know group of champions is still to be somehow established, but I think is in the making, and it's up to us as civil society to facilitate its uh, emergence. Now, um, how does this uh, offer responses uh, to issues of irresponsible lending or new instruments? Uh, uh, for risk sharing or um, that Martin mentioned at the very beginning. Well, that's precisely what a legal framework need to do, you know, um, clarify exactly what are the terms of contracts uh, that uh, a democratic nation can honor and which are the ones that are clearly to be considered illegitimate and understand how to deal with that particular situation. I think this would be but this is something that can only be addressed if you have a clear normative framework. If you don't have, it's literally an intractable and impossible problem to be addressed. Um, equally, on the private sector right now, we have a situation in which uh, as long as things are fine, they can cash incredible returns. And then when at some point things go south, then uh, automatically everything becomes a problem, as if uh, those returns uh, that they have cashed for so long uh, have not happened, right? Well, I think that's another element uh, that I think uh, has to be clarified. Risk, uh, you know, it's an essential part of private sector action. And I think this notion that we always need to risk, bring the risk to zero, it's a sort of a parastatal transformation of financial market, which I think it's not exactly where we need to do. The private sector, you know, can enjoy higher return, but it comes with higher risk. And when those risks materialize, well, you know, tough luck. You know, and that is something that again requires a clear normative framework to be empowered. Because otherwise what we confront 
is a situation in which not only they've enjoyed all the returns in the past, but they want to continue enjoying the same return even when certain situations, catastrophe, or simply changes in the global economic outlook materialize. Well, that's absolutely not acceptable, but unfortunately is what happens if the only rule is the contract rather than a clear normative framework. Now, in all of these, how do we deal with the bigger problem, you know, the, the colonial and ecological debt, as some of you has also mentioned? Uh, how do we deal with the normative hierarchies, with the approach to de-dollarization? Well, um, you know, it continues to be a liberation movement. That's the, that's the, the sad reality. Um, and that liberation, unfortunately, is something that cannot be exclusively confronted with national resistance. That's basically, that's basically the nature of today's circumstances. Because unfortunately, national resistance finds uh, a set of uh, legally binding agreement uh, that needs to be undone. Think about, for instance, the implication of investor state dispute settlement mechanism on the capacity of governments to take policy or public investment decisions in favor of developmental objectives of human rights. No? So unfortunately, that deregulation has been regulated. And the only way to undo it and replace it, that's the reason why national uh, resistance doesn't work anymore. You need to combine a national strategy or regional strategy with the reclaiming on normative interventions and governance reforms internationally. Without that, uh, unfortunately, we uh, end up confronting a number of very unhelpful normative hierarchies. So it continues to be a liberation struggle. It's just it's a liberation struggle from institutions that have replaced uh, the old uh, institutions of colonialism in a much more complicated and interconnected and intertwined um, system, which is actually supported by unhelpful laws and agreements. That's unfortunately the level of uh, uh, destructure and reconstruction that we need to do. And we can only do if we take a very strong grip over normative spaces. That's what tax, the tax community, the Africa group uh, has managed to do with the initiation with the UN tax convention. That's exactly what we need to do in terms of reclaiming the debt architecture and a new normative uh, framework for debt. Thanks, thanks a lot, Stefano, for that. Uh, any more questions in the room? Yes, Samantha. Thank you very much, Stefano. Um, I'm thinking about the credit rating agencies when you spoke about how we need to reform them. And it's, you know, quite right. We need to reform them because of um, the inaccurate perception of African risk that they always give off. A very good example would be um, the South African case, I think, a week or two ago. Um, Fitch came out saying, you know, it would be... Um, a tragedy for South Africa's debt uh, trajectory if the ANCA was to uh, marry with the EFF or with the MK. And so for an international uh, financial institution that claims that it's independent and it's nonpartisan, for it to be you know, you know, saying something like that, it clearly means that they were for um, uh, a coalition with the DA, which is the right wing. And so thinking uh, about I'm, reform, I'm sorry. Sorry if I interrupt you, but there is a very, very heavy background noise. I can barely hear what is happening. There's a lot of moving of chairs, I think. OK, I'm sorry. I'll take it up again, if that's OK. Yes, so I was saying, um, I was in agreement with your point when you're talking about the reform of the um, um, credit rating agencies. And I was giving an example of South Africa uh, a week or two ago the Fitch rating agency was talking about how it would be in the best interest of South Africa, um, particularly the ANC, to marry with the EFF or, not, sorry, to marry with the DA because marrying with the 
EFF or the um, MK would be uh, a tragedy for South Africa's debt trajectory. And so I was saying for uh, an international financial institution, which is a credit agency uh, that says it is non-partisan and uh, is all about independence, for it to say something like that, it clearly means that it is not, um, uh, you know, promoting that kind of uh, independence or uh, non-partisanship. And so I was saying, um, from your point, when you're talking about how we need to reform these institutions, do we need to reform them or we need to create our own? I know the AFDB was talking about how maybe we need to have an African uh, credit rate, uh, rating agency of our own. And I'm thinking, how would that look like? And do we want to relegate the creation of such uh, to the FDB, or how do we as society organizations also then influence um, um, the creation of such? And what methodologies exactly would we be uh, advocating for for this creating, uh, rating agency to then come up and say, okay, this is the risk? Like, how do we then come up with a, with a methodology that gives off a fairly accurate um, uh, risk report for the African countries? Thank you. Um, Stefano, you can go ahead and uh, respond if you if you have a because there's no more hands in the room. Sure. Um, well, again, I apologize if I haven't had exactly all the different elements that you brought forward, but uh, um, I, I I do of course think that the reform of credit rating agencies is critical in that architecture because of. Uh, uh, several dimensions. The first one is it, it's an oligopoly. You know, it's basically three large institutions that control everything. So I think there is clearly a need uh, for a much more diversified uh, um, market rather than uh, these incredible power concentration in few hands, which comes with very s significant conflicts of interest. Um, secondly, there is an issue of having different considerations, different analysis uh, as a part of the actual rating. You know, you cannot analyze a government purely on its, uh, you know, repayment performance, uh, uh, while at the same time being completely oblivious uh, of its responsibility against its citizens. So, and, and lastly, I think there's a need uh, for sure to consider the pro-cyclical nature of what credit agency have induced in situations of debt distress. They have tended to make the problem worse and immediately worse rather than being an element of support to you know, a transition that might actually been uh, induced by very good and very responsible reasons from a point of, of uh, the government that initiated in a sense, whichever process. So this requires largely anti-monopoly and conflict of interest regulations. It requires the establishment of a plurality of credit rating agency, including some of public nature, both uh, regionally, but also internationally. So it's really fundamental that the, the reform of this particular element of the architecture is central and is part and parcel huh? of that sort of notion of a multilateral legal framework on that. I think, um, Stefano, I I'll try and also just chime in a little bit um, to supplement what you um, had mentioned in your response to Samantha. So I think it also goes back to some of the stuff we discussed yesterday and, and how um, influential, but in a negative way, credit rating agencies t tend to be and how they can actually affect and impact behavior of government. So yesterday and, and uh, between, uh, through the presentations that uh, uh, Theo made and, and uh, Jane took us through, you can, you can see how it affects the ability, how credit rating agencies affect the ability of governments to take a decision to own up that they have a debt problem. But in this case, um, what you've mentioned, Samantha, is that it could also influence uh, the perception of what perhaps a good government could be, but has influenced a different type of outcome, uh, given that you know markets may get worried, they may have jitters. So I think that entire, beyond just the economics of what credit rating agencies do, I think the political economy and, and how their political influence uh, 
um, in this setting is actually very important. And I think it feeds in also to the first slide that Stefano presented on underst us really understanding also the political environment within which um, we as a continent uh, interact in, but also the, the manner in which debt as an instrument and all its different components um, interact as well, and, and how it informs and affects different types of um, decision making. So I just wanted to sort of compliment that, um, Stefano, and then I'll sort of hand it back to John now to take us home. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Stefan and comrades in the room for the amazing interaction that we've had during the session. And I think uh, being an afternoon session and with the nature of the module that uh, we've gone through, I think we must, I must recommend each and every one of us for paying full attention through and through. And maybe I don't know, Stefano, if you have any final remarks you'd like to put across before we conclude. My only remark is my deep uh, regret for not being there in person. And I promise that that shall be the last time this happens. Uh, <laughs> so looking forward to. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot, Stefano.